is being chased, thrown on the run, and it is caught. Touchdown, Keenan Allen. What a grab. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. That's the Warrior spirit right there, boy. Huge sack by Joey Bosa. 90-yard touchdown. 90-yard touchdown. Then it's going to be picked off at the 8-yard line by Derwin James. Herbert sets his feet, takes a shot downfield, has Knighton. Caught! Touchdown, Chargers! That's the greatest throw I've ever seen. The Chargers are going to the playoffs! Hello and welcome to the festive season edition of the Thunder Down Under Chargers football podcast. Andy, your host here, joined by Jack. Happy holidays to everyone out there. Merry Christmas to you, my good friend. First time in a long while we've had the Indeed. pleasure of watching a game together, let alone live. There were moments of yes. uh, stress. Yes, what a privilege it was. <laughs> yeah, very fun, mate. A couple of moments of unnecessary stressful football, as always, but all in all, a pretty comfortable win. How have your holidays been so far, mate? Yeah, very good. Uh, full of rich food and probably too much wine and alcohol. So, uh, sort of on the on the back nine, as they say, get, heading into New Year and getting ready for twenty twenty three. But uh, no, it's been great. It's been good to hang out with you and um, a lot of the family. Went down to the beach for um, for Christmas Day with my fiance's side of the family. So now it's been ripper. But Merry Christmas to everyone, uh, to all our listeners, and uh, and hopefully see you in the new year as well after this show. Oh, very good, mate. Yeah, look, lots of quality time with family and friends. Spend a bit of time with you as well, which is great while you're in town. Um, and the spoils of just having a week or so off work, which is just nice. Nice to enjoy some live football, yes. do all that jazz. As I said, happy holidays to all our listeners out there as well, however you celebrate and spend it. Welcome on board. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, please give the show a like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for updates on new content, especially as it's heading into such a juicy part of the year. Now that we're a lock for good January football. Uh, can't forget our fellow co-host who is gallivanting through the canyons of Utah and stuff. I think he had a little bit to, to say, so we might just touch in with him. How are you, Al? We've done it, boys. Chargers make the playoffs. Justin Herbert is my dad, Brandon Staley is my dad, and Derwin James is my daddy. Go Chargers! Psycho! <laughs> <laughs> oh, very exciting. Oh, man. Couldn't possibly think what he's referring to Derwin James being his daddy about, but uh, I have a feeling we'll touch on that uh, shortly. Well, All right. So. Uh, the Chargers knocked off a pretty hapless Colts outfit on Monday Night Football. We've got a cross-town rivalry or down-the-hole rivalry match ahead of us in Week 17 against the LA Rams at SoFi Stadium. And I believe Al is also caught up with a friend of the show while in Southern California. So we'll throw in a bit of a laugh there uh, after we get through our game recap. All right, let's get into it. The Los Angeles Chargers 20, Indianapolis Colts 3. The Raiders lost, the Jets lost, the Patriots lost. It was simple. Win and it's playoffs. And that they did. In what was a pretty frustrating offensive performance, the Chargers' defense was everywhere for the larger portion of the game. Three interceptions, seven sacks, 23 total pressures, and zero out of 10 on third down conversions gave Foles headaches all evening and provided Joe Lombardi with plenty of opportunities to put points on the board. Herbert had patches of brilliance, but the stat sheet won't really represent an MVPS kind of day. Still went at over 77% completion for 235 yards, zero touchdowns and an interception. Protection-wise, it was a tough day for the rookies, Salyer and Johnson, giving up seven of the team's nine pressures. Herbert converting 40% of those pressures into sacks a season high. Keenan Allen really starting to heat up at the right time of the year after prolonged stints on the sideline throughout the season. 11 receptions on 14 targets for 104 yards. He and Mike Williams, 4 of 4 for 76, each clinical on 3rd and 4th downs. The Bolts clinched and those teams hovering around the 7th spot are left clenching their assholes over the next two weeks. Miami in the box seat, but with more quarterback dramas, who knows what will happen as the regular season rounds out. For the Colts, another dismal offensive performance and another season ending with question marks around the true replacement for that quarterback, Andrew Luck. It wasn't perfect, but the team's first two-plus score win for 
God knows how long. Jack, start us off, mate. <laughs> well, well put. That was that was a nice, concise, Andy. I think that was uh, really well said too. Um, listen, before we get on to what you alluded to in terms of perhaps Herbert's non MVP esque style of day, let's let's focus on some positives to start. So uh, let's let's just start with this defense. Um, over the last three weeks, there have been number one uh, in many categories across the league. So. You know, we've always said on this podcast, trust in Brandon Staley. A lot of people were doubting him in the middle of the year. A lot of pundits were saying, is this guy a defensive mastermind? Can he actually coach? Let alone losing your premier pass rusher, your premier cornerback, half of your defensive line. Um, and you're playing with sometimes, you know, your third, fourth, fifth stringers. The amount of pressure that we got on uh, Nick Foles was incredible. The secondary is playing together. We've got, finally, we've seen a game where we're getting some interceptions and some actually generating some turnovers. I always wonder when we watch the charges, I go, oh man, you know, sometimes I wish there was a game where the other team would just turn it over really easily. Yes, we get a lot of strip sacks and we have, um, and strip fumbles this year, but uh, no, it was wonderful, wonderful to see, um, especially that, uh, that, that Derwin James INT, man, oh man. What what an absolute play. And there's no one criticizing him for, oh, we should have actually batted the ball out of bounds in that one. No, he picked it off, some toe drag swag. Uh, man, yeah. that got us out of our seats, didn't it, Andy? Yeah, beautiful. Loved loved everything about that play. Loved his game. It was just, I mean, we, we should just knock it on the head, the Derwin James stuff, I think, because yeah. there was a lot of contention. It was We were on Twitter during the game and a lot of yes and no's about his ejection. It was just kind of a bit unfortunate to see how he uh, he let his emotion get the better of him on that drive. There was the Alec Pierce tackle, then the face mask penalty a few plays later. And then, look, I mean, it did look like he went shoulder to shoulder, but when you're angling it at that kind of height and speed and you don't have that much control over how you're hitting, you know you're going to sort of deviate off the shoulder straight into the guy's helmet. Um yeah, as we'll get to, he's in the, Derwin himself's in the concussion protocol after getting ejected for that hit, and I think it was probably fair enough. Uh, but look, once again, um, Gilman and Nasir Adderley stood up in his absence, and you didn't even notice that Derwin wasn't there. So even if he has to miss this game against the Rams, um, I think it won't be the uh, the worst thing in the world. Um, yeah, man, the yeah. defense was monster. I mean, it... Sorry. I was going to say, I mean, it's a perfect case study of a leader who's been out the last couple of weeks. His defense that he leads has been playing really well, and he wants to come back and make an impact. Uh, you alluded to there was that face mask penalty, but it, and was it Alex Pierce or Pittman got him on that kind of crackback block? Um, mm. You know, he was in the perfect position to, to tackle the runner, and he sort of got taken unawares. So he was running hot. Um, I think you summed it up really nicely, Andy. I mean, people will disagree with me when I say this, but those are the kind of hits that we need to take out of the game, uh, you know, because not only did – who was the who was the wide receiver that got hit? Who was it? What was his name? Uh, Ashton Doolan. Ashton Doolan, yeah. I mean, not only was he in severe trouble, I mean, Doolan also. So, um, you know, it, it's not yeah, a great look. A lot of people would say that – a lot of people would say that it hit his shoulder first and then hit his head. And then some people were going, well, why didn't uh, Joshua Kelly – there was a hit on Joshua Kelly out of bounds that was a helmet to helmet. So why wasn't that – an ejection um you know it's it's something that they'll that'll always be contentious but um i think it was the right call to eject him i'm not so sure but it probably is the right call to give a penalty away so uh, let's just hope well, dj's well, okay and he sort of learned from that yeah you, you said it perfectly we want to out they want to outlaw that kind of stuff we're fed up with seeing guys whose careers get cut short because they get head knocks because the technique isn't um, executed properly where it can be. Not only will do and miss this upcoming game because of concussion, but having just bought all of his DBs and coaches, Rolexes and <laughs> chains, I reckon he's going to cop a pretty hefty fine for that smack. So, look, yeah, um, yeah look, he's, he's going to learn a lesson and I think he knows that that's not the kind of player that he is. He's not a, a dirty player. Um, Coach Staley defended no. him quite quite roundly uh, that it just hit the shoulder, hit the head and, um, you know, 
It's not what we want to see. But yeah, look, the rest of the, the defense rallied. You make a good point. He, he probably just is very uh, hyped to be out there and being a part of it. They were, they were monstering. Seven sacks from 14 pressures. Um, forced errors from Foles all day. Just the, the, the guys getting the, the difference in the guys. Like, what was it? Seven sacks to six different players or something. And um, mm. you get interceptions and just jack shit output on 10 plus yard throws. The 0 from 10 on third down conversions, sensational. Um, Huge. And it's, it's really good. We're, we are starting to see a, um, a rounding the corner on all of the contention and all the hate that's gone towards Staley and this defense. And Al was very specific in some of his messaging to me about how he just wanted to, to jump up and shame the haters. And um, the old sit down, shut the fuck up kind of areas. But look, I don't think we can jump too much. We've got to regulate some of the hype. Uh, we've, we were, you know, as you said, we're now ranked since week 14, we're ranked first in, um, points against, averaging 11.3, and yards against, 225. But before that, <clears throat> excuse me, we were 30th in points per game allowed and 26th in yards per game. So we've also just played Tua and a pretty hobbled wide receiver group in Miami. Uh, and injured Ryan Tannehill, no offensive weapons except for Derrick Henry, who, who wore out in that game, and this disaster of a Colts offense. So... Um, there's, you know, we've still got a long way to go, but the signs are there. They're, they're positive. Um, we're seeing so much more production from Kyle Van Noy as well, which is great. Uh, leadership and he's getting home. Um, Kenneth Murray, man, um, just been so, been so impressed with him about how he's recognising coverage and executing. I will say you've got to take those interceptions. That was in the bread basket. He was watching the player, um, not the ball. Playoffs is do or die, and that is a big die moment in in different circumstances where you you know you got to have that. So, um, yeah. Anything further on uh, defense from from your side? What are you seeing in the the run defense? It wasn't too bad, but it was almost like the Colts got behind and then just started abandoning the run because they were still getting five point two yards per clip with um, Zach Moss. They just <laughs> kept throwing the ball and turning it over essentially. Well, that's right. And um, Jeffrey Saturday was a big, you know, I did say it on the last podcast that he was going to throw the kitchen sink at us and whether that's going for it on fourth downs and probably throwing a lot more without Jonathan Taylor. I mean, they were still getting a decent clip, but, you know, the biggest thing, and I think we said it on a couple of weeks ago, but those big gashing runs are just not happening anymore. The big busts to the outside aren't happening. The edges are being set by, as you say, Kyle Van Noy, um, Kenneth Murray and Drew Tranquil are playing far better in the run game and even though sjd's pff grade was was still quite low he still leads that unit of as i said third fourth fifth string guys morgan fox fei hoko um you know i, I did just want to say something about staley in his press conference spoke about is that getting these experienced guys in and you know we were pretty hot on carl van noy coming in at the start of the year and not having a big impact and we're going well is this a bit of a wasted signing Callahan has proved to be really good. Uh, SJD has sort of grown in his role, as I said before. But And Khalil Mack, you know, started off really hot, but has kind of dropped away, but just does the basics really, really well. He does set that edge. He's that player that the other team will double team all the time. So Staley said it's about getting these guys in with the rookies, getting... Um, getting older players who know how to not only manage the game and sort of understand the game, but also manage their bodies and know when to peak. You know, you don't really, you don't want everyone peaking at week four because then it's just a downhill spiral. So I really see that Kyle Van Noy and a lot of these, these older guys that have come in are probably beginning to say, hey guys, like I've done this for 10 plus years now. You know, don't worry, it'll all start coming together. Yes, we're winning games by, you know, three points, um, but that's all right. We'll galvanize. We'll go and have our uh, our dinners where they sit and have 30 to 40 players there and they're throwing food, apparently. That's based on the report that we were reading. But they're peaking at the right time. Um, and even as you said, this is still the NFL. And yes, it, it was a hobbled Dolphins. It was a hobbled Titans. And it was a pretty average or below average um, Colts offense. Still you, know, you still have to do it. You still have to. You still have to win. So, no, it's really exciting. And it's a credit to Brandon um, about his teaching 
um, and, and, and building that culture, which is great. Yeah, definitely. Um, what I think is, is amazing as well is that Van Noy has actually been able to generate, look, an improve, a gradual improve to now he's getting like regular production. But he's also been asked to play a lot more snaps than he would have expected to. With Joey Bosa being out for so long, um, Chris Rumpf sustained injuries throughout the year. We didn't really have a stopgap. Um, Derek Tusker was kind of trash as an outside linebacker um, just to take some of those rotational snaps. Now, Kyle Van Noy's been playing a lot more ball, and he's actually been able to, with his experience, I'm assuming, um, find a way to... Uh, take the right time off, if you know what I mean, and rest when he can. Mm. And his body seems to be in good nick to be playing a heap of games of ball, which is um, really fantastic. And you know, we'll get to it a little bit. There's chat that maybe Joey Bosa might be coming back. And look, that just adds strings to the bow in what's been um, a really sharp executing defensive unit in the last three weeks. You still got to go out and do it. You, mm. You're exactly right there, man. Exactly right. Uh, all right, oh, offensive I mean, you side. Said, you the... said it before, man. Oh, sorry. Mm. No, no, well, no. Sorry, listeners, I think we've got a bit of a lag here, but that's all right. Um, you, you said about it, Kenneth Murray, he played 31 coverage snaps and PFF rated him almost an 82, which is elite. So the guy's improving, and that's all we wanted to see, right? It's taken a while, um, but he needs, to, he needs to keep doing this because if we lose Tranquil and we don't sign Drew Tranquil next year, he's going to be linebacker number one, and he's going to be leading that unit. So let's hope that he can live up to that first-round grade um, and continue improving. But credit's where, credit where credit is due. Well done, Kenny Murray. Let's, let's just, let's just keep, keep on doing it, man. Keep doing it. Yeah, I agree with you. Really enjoying his improvement. Uh, all right, offensive side of the ball. Um, mm. Look, as I said, I, th I thought I saw a little bit of regression in Herbert's pocket awareness. This could be some of that, or it could just be a really basic play calling effort by Lombardi where, you know, when you're turning 40% of pressures into sacks, you're, we're seeing a, a great reduction in bootlegs and... Um, play action uh what, what did what did you say did you say anything in particular about that that why herbert was getting eaten up and or what was wrong with the protection uh, i don't know i mean it wasn't one thing necessarily from a player or protection you know i was tweeting furiously about it and and i'll go back to the explanation that i gave last week it's the system versus the quarterback right and who supports who I still feel like Justin Herbert is supporting the system, whereas it should be the system supporting the quarterback. I felt like he was just so confused on the routes. I felt like Gus Bradley actually called a really good game against us. He took away Herbert's safety valves. You know, those those passes out to the flat to Eckler and Kelly weren't getting much chop. Um, there wasn't a lot of creativity in Lombardi's play calling. There seems to be no creativity when things break down either the only person that shows some creativity is keenan allen getting open um he runs a stick route realizes that that's that's not there and then he'll find space in the uh in the zone or or in man mike williams even though he did have some pretty big receptions i thought was shut down really well by stephen gilmore um and and listen the colts defensive line they're no slouches armstead um they've they've got some not armstead um Buckner. who's the other boy i can't remember yeah, um, pay DeForest Buckner, they were playing really well. Yeah. yeah, they were playing. And credit to them because they never, they just didn't give up. Uh, and they had a couple of injuries too. But yeah, I'm, for me now, I'm over Joe Lombardi. Um, I did see a tweet today, and this is a question that I'll throw back to you, Andy, is that <laughs> the ultimate optimist, I can't, I can't remember who it was, said that just wait everyone what joe lombardi's doing is he's just limping at limping the offense to the playoffs and then when we get in the playoffs he'll he'll put a completely new playbook in there and we'll absolutely torch teams by scoring 40 points a game <laughs> and, I, and i said well well played to this person who ever did this tweet but i'm not too sure about that <laughs> oh if this is buy sell or hold i am selling that i'm stealing it and giving it to the brotherhood that's nonsense um yeah yeah i mean look Fool me once, right? But uh, I don't think that that's going to be how it is. Um, it's such a 
it's such a leveling concern when you see that the defense is playing so well, but we're struggling to score 25 points with Justin Herbert as the quarterback mm. consistently. I couldn't even, you know, red zone failures with two or four this week. You have that, you have that game go to 28, three, you know, four points extra on each of those drives. Uh, you're feeling a whole lot better about it. And you, you're probably going, oh, look, Lombardi wasn't perfect, but at least we've executed four out of four on the red zone. Um, I don't think the Colts were a particularly good red zone defense. Um, no. But the yeah, it's just, you know, we're having the majority of our targets on third and fourth down pass attempts are behind the line of scrimmage still. Um, yeah. They're just not getting guys schemed open. Uh-huh. I was interest, interested as well that um, uh, Gerald Everett, zero targets. Josh Palmer, only three targets. Like you said, the uh, the Colts did well to cut out those check downs to the flat. Uh, I, was, I was, look, I was impressed to a degree with the commitment to the run game. Um, I thought they used it well when it was there to be used. We managed the clock well because of it. Spread the load with Kelly. Mm. I think they're starting to work out. Austin Eckler's getting a little bit banged up. He's doing a lot of it in the run and pass game. Um, I'm getting, con- I'm continuously more and more impressed by how Kelly's running the ball. I feel safe with his protection of the ball and him taking a few reps off Eckler uh, as the home, as the regular season rounds out. But still, look, nothing more than 3.7 yards a carry, which is our season average and real junk. Um, 101 yards on 31 attempts, but two two touchdowns on the ground when we couldn't get it done on in the air. So it's nice to see that there is a little bit of balance and everyone sort of comes to support when when needed. Red zone offense, man, you talked about it. And this is where ultimately the lack of creativity shows. You look at what KC do in the end zone with little shovel passes and, and motion and doing all this. Lombardi loves... His offense, he loves stick routes, he loves wide receivers, you know, sort of 10 to 15 yards away from the line of scrimmage coming back to the ball. Um, we, we were speaking about it when we were watching it live is that, you know, we're getting down to the three yard line, the two yard line. And if we can't run it in, there's absolutely no room for our receivers to work because it's such a compressed amount of space. So where is that creativity? Where is the where are the little um, you know the, the the designed runs or designed motions to actually or fades? Like I haven't seen an end zone fade this year, and we've got a bloody basketball team. We've got guys six foot six foot one, six foot four, six foot five, six foot seven, six foot eight, and Donald Parham. But we're not doing anything of that. Like I don't. It must be so frustrating for Brandon um, to sit there and go, "What is this guy doing?" You know. And you said no targets to ever. I mean, I don't think DeAndre Carter touched the ball either. And he's yeah, been really important in, um, in in getting touches um, and getting some of those hidden yardage that's not from Keenan Allen on the stick wrap, Keenan Allen on the stick wrap, Keenan Allen, Keenan Allen, Keenan Allen. Oh, big one to Mike Williams. M- mixed in with these average runs and these, it's just, it's so frustrating. It's so, so frustrating. Well, what that says to me is that it's just trying to force the ball downfield because there's no creativity. And we're just trying to force it into Mike's hands and, uh, force it into Keenan's hands. Like 14 targets. Um, sure, he's our wide receiver one. But, I mean, golly, just we're not, there's no... Maybe you're right. Maybe Lombardi is trying to hide the rest of his playbook just so the playoffs are something different. <laughs> but uh, I still think that's a, a really blindly optimistic take. It's just like you've had a dream <laughs> and gone, oh, my God, this could happen. Power to you. If you <laughs> live your life that that um that positively, I've, I've got a lot of respect for you. Take your hat off to you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but again, you know, I, I won't I won't hark on this point, but two case studies in our coaches. One of them is a teacher. One of them, you know, has built a system of defense that takes a while to learn because it's very difficult. It's a difficult system because it's an empowering system. It's not a run these routes and get yards. It's that the defensive system is adapt to what's going on, adjust, you know, and, and be flexible. And that's that's the defense. And we've seen that. That's taken a while. That's taken 18 months, right? Um, this year, it's taken over half the season. But hopefully, we're seeing the the reward for that, that teaching, that adaptability. Players are feeling comfortable in the system. Conversely, last year, the offense was amazing. The offense was great, putting up big points, putting up big yards. Herbert looked, Herbert looked great. But once teams have a season of tape on you, 
of running this, they go, okay, look at these tendencies here. It's pretty clear that this is what they're doing. This is how we guard it. And that's when the teaching, that's when the adaptability, that's when the creativity comes into it. So has Lombardi built a system that's empowering to his players? I don't think so. I think it relies on Keenan Allen and Mike Williams to make incredible plays. It requires Justin Herbert to make incredible plays to look good. Um, and other than that, there's not much else. There's not much else going on. Conversely, you've got Staley. Yes, the, the, the results haven't been there immediately, but we're seeing that 18 months worth of work um, and, and the system and how he wants to play on that side of the ball. And that's where I'm going to leave it. I, 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 I'm going to call it. I don't think Joe Lombardi uh, should have a job next year. Um, I think it's time to get a younger guy in there. Brandon's had two years of head coaching experience now, probably doesn't need the old head as much as he thought he did. Um, it's time to get some creativity because, as you said, how can we struggle to score 20 points a game when we've got a top three, four, five quarterback in the league? It just doesn't make sense to me. For sure. Well, okay, well, <clears throat> before we move on from it, I know you've just said that's all you're going to say on it, but moving uh, past Joe Lombardi, we spoke at, at length, uh, you and I, in the, in the Uber on the way to the pub after the game, about what the solution can be for greater offensive efficiency moving forward. And whether that, does that start this year or does it start next year? Is there a world where changing the play caller can upset the apple cart at this point? Can you relinquish the OC of said duties without firing them or completely fucking up the, <laughs> the offensive chemistry in the building? Is that, what, what's the solution? What do you think? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, you could go, you know, is it, is, is it the playbook that is non-creative and non-adaptable or is it the play caller? And if you put the playbook that Lombardi has into a different uh, set of hands, so like a Shane Day, for example, does that change the offense? Does that change the way that uh, Herbert perhaps thinks? Does, you know, if he's making um, calls at the line and he's adjusting plays and things like that, um, does he have a better relationship with Shane Day than he does with Joe Lombardi? I mean, these are all questions that none of us will ever know because, you know, we don't know unless we're inside the building. Um, listen, I think responsive, responsible wise, you don't change, you don't change Joe Lombardi heading into the playoffs. I mean, the team's made the playoffs, right? So, um, you're just going to have to stick with it and maybe, maybe because these games are, you know, he's now got two weeks where the offense doesn't necessarily, well, we might talk about whether players are going to play or not, but he's got some time before our first matchup, um, to think about, okay, how are we going to get some, uh, some production? How else do you do that? I, I, listen, I don't know off the top of my head what kind of offensive coordinators are going to be out there. Um, I did see a list this morning, but they're still like, I mean, someone said Cliff Kingsbury, and I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want the air raid offense. Um, but how else in the offseason, looking to add some speed? I don't think Guyton um, is the answer. Looking to add some speed, some, diff some different stuff. Um, and we can't keep blaming it on missing the left tackle because the protection has been half decent. It's been better than it has been in years. So yeah, sorry. There's, that's, there's no answer there, mate. I apologize, but um, <laughs> who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? It was, <clears throat> it was a long form answer. That's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if you're talking about Slater um, at left tackle be, being an excuse, that's, that runs perfectly into the, the next question I had for you. If he is able to return this year, what is your ideal formation on the line, assuming that the current others stay healthy and everyone is available as they are? Slater is just the new addition. So who would you have? How, yeah. how, would, you, how would you start it? Interesting one. I think you keep it as it is. Um, I think Pipkins, you play Pipkins out there and you put Solia in as just a swing tackle. So you have okay. Slater at left tackle, Filer, who did a good job and has been stringing some better games together. Uh, Lindsley in the middle, you've got Johnson um, in there at uh, right guard, and then you have Pipkins at right tackle. I, th I think that's what I think that's what you go with. Um, and then you've got, you know, a guy that's been playing at a pretty decent level as a swing tackle. So you can get rid of uh, Norton, not that he's been, you know, been lining up much. Um, you know, Will Clapp is in there. I think Total that's a waste. fairly solid, that's a, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a fairly solid line. Um, can I throw a question back at you? No, certainly. We love looking at the Chargers social media. And it was an interesting uh, video of who Staley gave the game ball to. 
at oh, the bastard. end of the game. So I oh, was so going to ask me that. Um, but so can you talk to me about some of the reasoning behind why he's maybe done that? Uh, y- what I think is the reasoning. Um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Okay, so I saw that and I was a bit surprised uh, when I saw it first time. And all I thought was, okay, this is what... I thought it was a statement. I thought it was almost a political statement from Brandon Staley saying, in a way, thank you for sticking by me this year. Um, Thank you for believing in me. But also, we've had that many outs. We're nine and six. We're going to the playoffs. Fire me now. And it was a message to the fans as well and all the doubters. And he's going, fire me now. Fuckers, we're going to the playoffs. Shut up. We're going to the playoffs. And if you had any other team in the position that we were in as far as like a banged up score, um, achieving what we had, then congratulations, you deserve everything that is coming your way. So that's, I'll I'll keep it as succinct as I can because I could waffle, but I think there was a little bit for Staley, a little bit for Spanos as well there. So that's how I saw it. Um, I don't know if uh, there was anyone on the field that probably deserved it more. So nice opportunity. He said he'd been looking for that opportunity for the whole time he'd been a coach. And now that they've clinched that playoffs, his first playoffs as a coach, Justin Herbert's first playoffs as a franchise quarterback, uh, it seems quite a fitting thing and I'm feeling it's far more wholesome uh, than I did initially. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, I think it's a very much a big, smart political move. And Staley always talks about we're, we're a family here. We're run by a family. We're run by a family. Mm. Staley, Staley is a, he's a scholar of the past because we know what ha- happened to, to Schottenheimer. We know what happens to Lynn. We knew what happened to McCoy. You know, these guys that want to, you know, a very much rah rah, maybe not Schottenheimer so much, but definitely McCoy, definitely Lynn. Uh, he understands it because as a head coach, not only do you need to know your X's and O's, you also need to manage people and not just the people under your purview. You need to manage the people above you as well. And I think he's playing the political game really, really well. So that's another aspect that our last couple of coaches have not really understood particularly well, which is that organisational empathy and understanding not only what goes, um, you know, what you're responsible for in terms of, you know, what happens out in the field, but also managing those relationships with ownership, managing relationships with the media um, and, and making sure that you're always spinning those plates uh, positively. So well done, Brandon. I thought it was, a, as you're right, I thought it was a bit of a fire me now, mate. Well put. Yep. Uh, while we're on the social media things, just before we, we move on to another form of social media stuff, how is the yoga, pre-game Staley yoga and all the <laughs> memes that followed that? We won't get too too stuck into it, but he was doing a few arches and hunches and... Cat cows. You, know, you, just, you, just, <laughs> you just perfectly position the Colts logo right in front of his general crotchal area and uh, you got a Monday night football humping, baby. Um, <laughs> right, well, I think we've... Uh. We've just uh, just about covered all the all the ties there. Um, all right, as I said, old mate Ali Boy has been socialising his way around Southern California. Uh, he did catch up with Kyle, and they dropped us a video last week on the show. This time, he's caught up with another friend of the show, co-host of the Lightning Round podcast, Garrett Sisti. So uh, let's take a look at what he's got in store for us this time. Hey, Jack and Andy, Garrett here. I found some guy here. You wanted an autograph, I gave it to him. Um, hey, let me get, let me uh, take the glasses off. All right, so when you're recording this, we're all positive. We love to be positive. Chargers are making the playoffs. What matchup do you guys fear the worst? I know Steve's going to be hard, Bill's going to be hard. But in terms of matchup, matching up offense, defense against the Chargers, who would you not want to face in the playoffs? And then also, Alistair's going to be going to the Rams game. 
How drunk is he going to be before the game? Is it he's not going to make it into the stadium? Is it going to be that he's going to need help to be dragged inside the stadium? How drunk will he be before he goes to the Rams game? Appreciate you guys. First time, long time. Love you. You guys got to come out here next. Thanks. <laughs> uh, that's bloody <laughs> awesome. Thanks for uh, Garrett to take the time out to Thanks, Garrett. drop us a line there. Yeah, as positive as we can be. Well, you nailed it, mate. We're in the playoffs, baby. So uh, a bit still rides on our remaining fixtures. That fifth spot is still a bit unlikely, but still a possibility. Um, if I were the team, I'd be gunning for that for sure. Jack, to answer his first question, who is your mm. least attractive matchup heading into the playoffs? Well, Garrett said, you know, the Chiefs and the Bills, we, we know that they're, that they're tough ones. So I'll, I'll sort of stay away from there because we know that the Chiefs is always going to be a tough one. Um, currently, we're playing the Bengals, uh, and they've just lost their left tackle for the year. So uh, I, I won't touch on them either, but I think out of the last, so you've got Jags, Dolphins, and Ravens currently. Um, I think the big one there would be the Ravens because I think Lamar Jackson's got a pretty long memory. And uh, they're, they're, they're Mark Andrews is having a great year. Um, you know, we always struggle with tight ends, a la Travis Kelsey. Uh, and Mark Andrews is, is having one of those years. Um, he's actually, you know, three Pro Bowls in a row, I believe now. So, um, and Lamar Jackson on the ground. And we know how difficult we find it to stop the run. So the Ravens would be a, a challenge, um, I believe, uh, more so than the Jags or the Dolphins, given to his... Um, concussion protocol in his third one now so yeah ravens for me ravens would be a tough one because i think he'd, they want to lay the smack down after what we did to them a couple of years ago with uh phil rivers yeah there is the there is that history there they've also smoked us uh in the regular season like they did last yeah. year so they are a, a pretty scary one now even though lale collins is out uh for me i think it's the bengals um they've they've got the playoff experience Joe Burrow gets sacked plenty, still throws four touchdowns, fourth quarter comeback wins. He's, he, he just has this, he's just so cool. Um, he has probably been uh, more impressive, I think, overcoming inconsistent protection than Herbert has this year. Maybe Zach Taylor and their offensive gurus are a little bit more creative than Lombardi. They've got gun talent across the board. Um, they've still got... Good, good defensive players as well. Um, Seven-game win streak. Uh, yeah, but they're behind the Chiefs and the Bills is the the third scary one. Um, then probably for me, the Jags, and I'm thinking be a bit, might eat my words on this one, but hopefully Lamar Jackson's just not quite right and the Ravens don't mm. even see their way past uh, the first week of the playoffs. Um, all right, now onto the onto the juicy question: How drunk will Al get? Do you want to field this one first, mate? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, Alistair has a proclivity to get very excited uh, very early on in events like this, and I'm not even talking about of the day, but I'm talking about the night before, where he gets so excited that he actually doesn't sleep. He's like a little kid on Christmas. Uh, it's it's well known that he stays up till about four to five a.m. Uh, and going, I can't get to sleep. We'll eventually fall asleep, wake up at 6.30 and then be so excited. He'll have a shower and be ready to go, even though the event doesn't start until 10 or 11 in the morning. So I'm going to say that Alistair goes a little bit too hard too early. He's going to have a little bit of a an, a shoulder to cry on with Kirst there. And Kirsten will keep him on the, the straight and narrow. So I'm saying he gets really drunk really early, but then then actually has to sober up and actually eventually enjoys the game. So I, I do think he gets in, inside the stadium, but he's he's going to be drinking pretty hard pretty early, even maybe a tactical spew in the first two hours. So we'll see how we go. Oh, well, I think you've you've pointed out the hyper-excitement areas very well, and it's it's <laughs> very important when you break down this question from, from Garrett because the unflexing of this Sunday game, out of the night schedule might actually do Alistair some favorites, uh, some favors rather. He's to his credit, he's he's pretty good at holding his liquor uh, and maintaining, um, you know, plateauing appropriately for the day. It is his first football game, so uh, first Chargers football game. So um, no doubt he's going to be very excited. 
I think he will get very well stuck into it in uh, Thunder Alley, in the tailgating, um, but peak at the right time. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if there's parts of the game that he just can't quite remember. Uh, if we get to that. I think he'll be upright. He'll have people around him to... <laughs> painting him out as a complete liability. But he is. So all the best to Kyle and everyone <laughs> going is. with him and anyone who bumps into him at the game. He's six foot one and has no spatial awareness. So cheerio. Uh, all right. <laughs> We've got the Rams. It's the SoFi Showdown. Week 17. Let's get into it. As far as the injuries go... Sorry, Jack. I, I know you wanted to shout out... Um, Someone who played on special teams. I cut you off before. No, that's all right. Um, huge one. Uh, when I haven't been doing my teachable moments in the last couple of weeks uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, I did write down that Dean Leonard um, getting out of bounds and touching the ball, which meant that the ball was dead and we, uh, the Chargers, retained possession on that fumble. Huge point of the game, um, but and maybe not as... You know, in the broadcast, it's kind of glossed over because it's not a glossy play. But just like that time when um, there was a special teams where a guy got uh, pushed into the receiver, um, in, into the guy receiving the punt, they fumbled and we got it. Huge, huge play. Very smart play. Now, whether Dean Leonard did that on purpose, it doesn't matter because Brian Fikens, again, having these huge impacts in crucial bits of the game. And that special teams is the gel between your offense and your defense to make sure that everything's working well in, in all three phases. So well done, Dean Leonard, and well done, Fiken. Yep, nice. And on top of the special teams comments, Dick is the guy. Uh, any field goal comes out, it's a drinks break time. You're safe. We're up three points. Uh, it's good. So, yeah, well put. Um, and it's good to point that out. Great heads play to collect that muff punt out of bounds and kill the play all right back to week 17 preview as the as far as the injuries from the game go i, th I believe xander horvath sustained some kind of an ankle injury unknown at this stage its degree and whether he'll be available for any kind of practice this week like we said earlier derwin's hit not only landed him out of the game he is in the protocol he did look like he was a bit out of it before he'd even hit the ground and his arms kind of buckled under him you don't like to see that sort of stuff um austin eckler was also limited at practice on wednesday with an unspecified knee injury so we'll see how those go both are still day-to-day -day about returning to practice i'd be surprised to see him activated for this week uh, but hopefully a return for he and perhaps rashawn slater in week 18 just to get a bit of um uh, match speed mm. under their belts heading into the playoffs Staley was asked in his press conferences about having any concern over the lack of production from the offense. It's got to be frustrating to see the team um, be able to move the ball like it has, and sometimes it's pretty chunky, or like choppy, rather. Um, but we're just wondering, scoring opportunities, as we said, 50% in the red zone. You've got to convert those chances, um, and the playoffs is a, is a different kettle of fish. So there's got to be a bit of... Bit of tension rising between uh, Staley and um, and Lombardi. Just you know, defense is doing their job. What are you guys doing? Come on, let's let's come to the party and actually be a force. There's a lot of chat around the the league that the Chargers are one of those teams that other teams don't really want to face in the playoffs. Uh, it seems like they're more scared mm. of them than we than we are. But um, look, we know that we're capable. We just haven't seen it yet, and maybe it's the potential that's fearful. Um, Really going to be interesting to see how the coaches prepare the players for not only the next two games, keeping the mindset right, still things on the line for these games. Um, you know, I think winning against the Rams will all but shore up that sixth spot um, and therefore not a wild card game against KC. But also then, you know, we'll, we'll look forward uh, in a couple of weeks to talking about how the coaches might be preparing the guys for um, their first playoff stint. All right. Jack, do you want to run us through the Denver and Rams game from Christmas Day? I can. Uh, one of the two hot messes of an organisation that the uh, that are in the AFC West at the moment, the Rams played the Broncos. Wowee. Um, they put up a 50-burger, 51 points to 14 uh, over the rudderless and some might say godless 
uh, Denver Broncos and Russell Wilson. Um, you know, Los Angeles snagged uh, four interceptions against uh, Denver. Kobe Durant, uh, one return for an 85-yard touchdown. Bobby Wagner picked off his ex-teammate in Russell Wilson. And also Jalen Ramsey was feasting as well. Um, they converted those points to – they converted those takeaways into 17 points, which is huge. Um, Akers had three rushing touchdowns. Tyler Higby played a really good game and had two receiving touchdowns. And Baker Mayfield was almost perfect. Who He finished 24 of 28 for 230 in t- and had two passing touchdowns to Higby as well. Uh, Akers finished the game with 23 for 118 in addition to his career high, uh, three rushing touchdowns. Um, and LA's defense also recorded a season high six sacks in the victory and kept Denver out of the end zone until eight and a half minutes remaining in the game. So they're coming off a very, very strong showing, which is a little bit worrying. But as I alluded to, the uh, the Broncos are in complete freefall. Uh, there was a fight on the sideline between um, uh, the backup Risner quarterback for the, the Broncos, Ripien. whose name Ripien. Brett Ripien. Dalton Risner and Brett and Ripien, Ripien, Ripien. Uh, that that Russell Wilson had to go over and sort of calm the offensive line down. And then after the game, our, the very own Chargers, Ode Abushi was smacked in the face by Randy Gregory. And that evolved into a bit of a fist fight. Um, as Baker Mayfield was being interviewed, he had to pull the presenter back to make sure she didn't get run over by huge men. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of chippiness. And I think that any team, you've got to be aware of any team that puts up 50 points on any NFL team. As we said, you know, winning in the NFL is still difficult no matter who your opposition is. So, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting little matchup. Yeah, I, I would love to... Just take 10, 15 minutes to just launch at the Denver Broncos and Russell Wilson. We'll wait on that one, I guess. Nathaniel Hackett. But we can do that next week. That's absolutely perfect. We, we can. Have next week. We are, it is like Christmas a fortnight later. It, it, I'm just that excited. <laughs> and, and in other divisional u- news, the Raiders have decided to sit Derek Carr. Devontae Adams is going, What? is going on here <laughs> what have i done there are just so many how many guys just want a time machine the browns probably do on uh, uh deshaun watson as well uh the titans have just absolutely amazing. fallen off a cliff and will probably miss the playoffs now uh the dolphins are going to be struggling going into the playoffs oh it's just great but we've got to go back to the rams we've got to focus on the rams they are the 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 task at hand what do you see as being their great strengths and the issues that the Chargers will face into this game? Yeah, listen, even though they put up 51 points, this is still not a particularly good football team with Baker Mayfield at quarterback. Uh, listen, the guy can still play, don't get me wrong, but he was hardly pressured against the Broncos. Uh, I mean, he was out of the game uh, close to halfway through. So, um, you know, you got to watch him, but putting, um, you know, he's... He, I mean, he's still capable, I guess. He's just, as I said, he's led a team of 51 points. So that's a strength. Bobby Wagner is having a great year. Um, he's PFF, PFF's first-ranked linebacker out of 85. Uh, incredible, incredible signing. A guy that we were kind of thinking that might have come to the Chargers, but we have been burnt with Thomas Davis and so many linebacker free agent signings in the past that we were very happy that he went to the Rams. But but Bobby Wagner is, is playing really well. So um, you've got to be really careful on uh, those flat passes that Wagner doesn't read them because he that's where he makes his money. Cam Akers, um, he's probably going to have a big day against us, I'd say. He can run the ball. He's back to sort of looking to where he was 12 or sort of the, before he did his Achilles. Um, Tyler Higby, we know that um, our cornerback room is, is slightly small. And if Derwin James isn't playing, then Higby can have another big day. Um, and the, I guess the question mark on Anna, Aaron Donald, whether he's going to play or not, if he does, that's a real big issue for us. And you got Jalen Ramsey out at, at quarterback too. And it's the McVeigh bowl. You know, I think Sean McVeigh will want to beat McVeigh. his, uh, his understudy yep. in, in his understudy in Staley. So he'll be coaching to win. Don't, don't get that wrong. Um, they're a proud organization. So, um, yeah, that's kind of a couple of the strengths that I could see. Any from you, or do you want to just move on to some of the weaknesses? Well, I think you actually make a good point about the 
you know, they're combatants between um, Staley and McVeigh because it was similar last week. You've got the defensive coordinator of the Broncos, Ajiro Aviro, who was the at at the Rams, and he ran a runs a his kind of variance on that. Um, sorry, is he at the Hawks? No, no, at the Broncos, and he runs a bit of a variance on that <clears throat> kind of Staley esque defense and. McVeigh really knew just how to pick it apart. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how <clears throat> Staley prepares for McVeigh's offense. But look, they've just got so many players out, don't they? Um, yeah. Donald might miss as well. Yeah, starting center, Brian Allen's still out. Uh, backup QBs aren't, aren't available. Ben Skoronek, the wide receiver, has got a calf issue. So hmm, who really knows what... Um, what the Rams are going to be able to throw at us. Uh, as far as their weaknesses go, look, as I said, their weakness, their injuries have ravaged them all season. And I think to, to say that their lack of availability is probably quite lazy. Um, I've taken a look at their offense over the last three weeks with Baker Mayfield as the quarterback. Um, he had wins against the Raiders and the Broncos and the loss against the Packers. Uh, up until this 51-point outing, he was averaging uh, 14.5 points a game, um, or, or the, the Rams were. Uh, he was consuming sacks at an ungodly rate, four, from 11, four sacks from 11 pressures uh, against the Raiders, two each to Crosby and Jones, and five sacks from 11 pressures against the Packers, with Preston Smith being troublesome there. Um, I think, yeah, like you said, the Broncos have just sort of packed it in and only had four total pressures against the, um, the Rams struggling line last week. So I think if the Chargers can, if the secondary can put pressure on uh, with their coverage and because Mayfield's getting the ball out fast, but if we can put pressure yeah. on those, those decisions, make him go through his reads and progressions um, and delay his time to throw, I think our pressure is, our pressure can get home. And maybe not another seven sack performance, but return of the Mac. He's coming hot again at the right time of year. And I think we can really force more turnovers and minimize any kind of output. Uh, hopefully Aaron Donald doesn't play. They've just got him on ice for the rest of the year so he can be healthy for next year. And Justin Herbert just gets through unscathed. So I guess that's my sort of key, keys to victory there is that um, we just have got to increase the time to throw for Baker Mayfield, tight coverage, and get pressure on and convert pressure, convert those forced fumbles into fumble recoveries, win the turnover battle again. Yep. Uh, my biggest one is this is a time for, if Donald is not playing, this is when we need to establish the run. So if I am the offensive coordinator uh, this week, I'm telling all my linemen, we're going to go out and we're going to establish the run against this line because between Hoked, Gaines, Williams, I mean Floyd, and then I've got someone called Brown the fourth in there, um, this is not a good defensive line at all. This is where we can establish the run. So I'd love to see a bit of Isaiah Spiller uh, in, in the lineup. Let's 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 get him in and some power running um, to give Eckler a bit of a rest, which I think might be happening. I think I'd really love to see Eck just step back a little bit and give Kelly Spiller um, some some runs and and really let's really push, let's let's really you know establish the run for the pass because I think if we can do that, this is a good time for Herbert to you know throw against some half decent uh, cornerbacks um, and you know their secondary with um, with Rap there uh, is is not too bad either so establish the run that's what I'd like to see. Um, and let's just keep Herbert's arm under 35 throws. That would be that would be nice. Yeah, look, they've definitely got some some ball players on the defensive back. Jalen Ramsey, Tyler Rapp, or Taylor Rapp, um, Nick Scott as well. They're all guys who can make plays on the ball. Um, but I mean, if Herbert's going to launch those short yardage throws like he did at Keenan Allen, you can't expect Keenan Allen to hang on to something that's coming faster than the. Uh, Faster than Superman at him, it's going to bounce up in the air and make it quite an easy interception. So let's try and be a little bit smarter. I don't need. I don't think we need to see too much out of the odd. Just a bit of a cohesive offensive game plan for Lombardi. Um, don't go giving away too much, but 
Let's actually get a little bit of rhythm, consistency, and just good form and feeling moving into the last week of the regular season and into the playoffs, please. Hmm. Uh, anything further in this matchup for you, mate? Nee? I think I we. I think our defense continues and absolutely stifles them as well. I think if we're going to put together four solid weeks um, because there's really no one on defense that needs a rest, arguably, because they're all sort of all the, all the top guys are injured. So keep playing. Um, and that'll roll into my score prediction. I'm going to say 10 27 to the Chargers. Nice. It's a good, healthy win. Uh, I am going 10 mm. 24 to the Chargers. And yes, just keep the ball rolling, keep the form going, clinch another. We'll just, you know, keep our position as high as we can in the wild card race. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see a few guys rested a little bit more. Uh, Eckler in particular. So yeah, just chuck the pads on Spiller if he's available to go, mm. get him in there um, and spread the offensive load. More to Palmer, more to Everett, more to Carter. And just make sure that we've got Keenan Allen and Mike Williams uh, ready to go. Awesome. Well, two wins from us in this SoFi Stadium. Al, when you listen, mate, have an awesome time at the game. We're very jealous. We wish we could be there one day. The two of us will come over, drink some beers with fellow Chargers fans alike, and uh, cheer on a meaningful win at the, um, the home of Californian football. All right. That's it from me. That's it from Jack. Bolt. Up, oh, baby. We'll see you next time on the Thunder Down Under Chargers podcast. Playoffs bound, baby. Go see you later. later. Turning, got it, 6 and 10, 5, high step, touchdown, San Diego!